So the purpose of this is to kind of go through the basics of advocacy. And um, the reason that we talk about this, and, it is, and it's, I think it's mistakenly assumed to not be that, that important of a topic um, when you're doing rescue and when you're working with shelters and when you're out working outside of shelters. But I will tell you that despite my attempts to cut myself from the conference every year, that the folks at American Pets Alive and Austin Pets Alive insist that this is very important. And I do get people every year come back and tell me that this was the most important or one of the most important sessions they went to. So thank you for being here. Um, and we'll do our best. We have a, sh a small group, so normally I ask for you to ask questions at the end, um, but since the group is so small, if you feel like you have a really important question in the middle, um, that's fine too. Just raise your hand and I'll do my best. Uh, if we get to the point where we're not going to cover enough material, then I'll ask you at that point to hold questions. All right, let's see here. So this is the outline of my presentation. First, arm yourself with the information that you need to be a better advocate. Two, build a no-kill campaign. Three, understanding and overcoming predictable and recurring challenges. Four, knowing when you're winning. And five, parting advice. And I should probably take a step back and introduce myself a little bit. Um, I am an attorney here in Austin. And um, back in 2005, I stumbled across, uh, or a cat came up to my front door. And his, we later named him Charlie, but he was bruised and beaten up, dirty, filthy, had cuts all over his body, and the neighbor's kids um, had been throwing rocks at him. But he shows up on the front porch, and he announces, like, I belong to you. This is where I live. And it didn't matter what we did. He kept on coming to the front porch and, like, waiting there and yelling at me every time I came in and out of the front door. So we eventually took him in. But I didn't know anything about animal welfare, nothing. I had had pets growing up, but not as an adult. Um, I didn't know anything about the animal welfare movement. I knew nothing about spay neuter. I knew nothing about vaccines. And I think the reason that I, that I think that's important is because the vast majority of the members of the public who we need on our side are like me in 2005, know nothing about these issues, know nothing about animal welfare, we are the irresponsible public that everybody likes to talk bad about, right? But we're not irresponsible, just haven't been introduced to it. And so I very much came from this from the outside. You know, I'm, I was not an animal career animal welfare person. I was somebody completely on the outskirts of it, completely on the periphery. And through that, I unfortunately discovered how badly our shelter was performing. Um, back in 2005, our shelter in the city of Austin shelter killed 14,304 animals, which was uh, 34 a day, um, every single day. And uh, it was one every 12 minutes the shelter was open to the public. Uh, it was a factory, right? It was a killing factory. That's what our shelter was. And um, I was appalled by it. But I started working, uh, trying to meet with animal welfare leaders in Austin, and every single one of them didn't think there needed to be a change. All of the SPCAs and the Humane Societies and everyone, they all, and the city council and the shelter manager and the city manager, all of them thought we were doing great at 50% save rate. And so I was completely on the outside looking in. And what I decided early on is while I wasn't an animal welfare person, what I was is somebody who doesn't give up ever. And I was somebody who had the advocacy tools and knowledge that I could use to affect what we were doing from the outside. Because I had a political science degree, a public policy degree, a law degree. And I knew that I could out public policy the folks that were doing the killing and the folks that were justifying all of the killing, despite the fact that they were all of the animal welfare insiders and I was an outsider. So this is, uh, this is the outline, and, and, and mainly what I want to what I, what I help you with is, is fast forward past all the mistakes that I made, um, because I made a lot of them along the way, uh, to learn some of the lessons that I learned the hard way by, by doing things wrong and by making mistakes, um, and getting you to a place where you can be more effective quicker than, rather than having to retread uh, the, the places that didn't work. Um, first, understanding the movement. Uh, Nathan Winograd, I talk about, I've talked about him in other sessions. Um, he's really very much kind of the, the, the founder of this movement that we're doing. Um, and he has multiple books on it. 
Uh, and I think it's really good to read a couple of those books because he tells you where we've been and where we're headed. And, and I really do think that the history matters. Familiarize yourself with the no-kill successes and the programs that got them there, but that's why you're here, of course. But uh, when we started this, I think there was one, when we started in Austin, there was one no-kill community in the country, and that was Ithaca, New York. And Nathan Winograd had made them no-kill. One, a single one. Um, and uh, while we were kind of fighting for no-kill in Austin, then Charlottesville, Virginia went no-kill, and then Reno, Nevada went no-kill. And we were able to use those cities as examples that it could be done. And now, I mean, we're talking about, there were three examples back then, now there are hundreds if not thousands of communities that are saving 90% or more of the shelter pets. So the, the best thing to do is find those places where, that look like your community and use them as examples when you're talking to your city officials. Understand where we've been uh, and where we're going. So less is, the, is uh, the aptly named description of the former strategy in animal welfare, which was legislate, educate, sterilize. That was what we were told for decades was the only way to reduce shelter killing. Legislate, educate, sterilize. We gotta legislate spay neuter, and we gotta legislate all these rules on people. Um, we gotta legislate people, you know, fence, uh, fence requirements or leash requirements, or we gotta penalize people for when they do things wrong. Uh, we gotta force, you know, we gotta educate. We just gotta educate the irresponsible public, and if we just educate the irresponsible public, we wouldn't have this problem, because it's the irresponsible public's fault that we're killing. And then sterilize, you know, we have to do all spay neuter, all the time, that's the only thing we should be doing. In fact, again, when we started this work in Austin from an advocacy perspective to work on the things that we knew would save lives because we modeled them after other cities, um, one of the things we were told by the major stakeholders in Austin was, no, we're not gonna spend money on, on saving the lives of any animals that are there because every dollar that we spend on saving the life of an animal that's in the shelter is a dollar that doesn't go to spay neuter. And if it's a dollar that doesn't go to spay neuter, it's going to, it's not, we're never gonna get out of this mess. That was the logic that I was told, which is that old strategy of legislate, educate, sterilize, that's the only way. But the new way out and the proven way out now are either you can use the 12, step, 12 ingredients that, that Ellen Jefferson talks about or the no-kill equation, which is, this, in my mind, largely the same thing. So this is what we modeled our programs on or our advocacy on from the beginning, which was Nathan Winograd's no-kill equation. TNR program for feral cats, high-volume, low-cost spay-neuter, rescue groups, foster care, comprehensive adoption programs, uh, including off-site adoptions in multiple locations, pet retention programs to keep pets in their homes rather than having them taken to the shelter, medical and behavioral rehabilitation so that we have the tools to treat the animals that come to us, public relations and community involvement because the public is the solution to the problem. They, we call it, that we, we have so, for so long said the irresponsible public is the reason where we are. Well, guess what? The public is the only way out of this mess. So we have to figure out how to engage the public in a healthy way. A volunteer program, proactive redemptions, is getting animals back to people. If an animal is picked up by an animal control officer, that officer's job should be to try to find the home right then and there, because likely it's very close by. Back in the day when I first started this in Austin, my wife worked at a uh, middle school in, a, in the most impoverished neighborhood of Austin. Um, very, very, very poor area with a lot of stray animals. And she found a dog uh, and it didn't have collar, didn't have any ID, and we saved it, but we knew that we wanted to find its owner. So we literally knocked on doors near the school that she was at we, and, and, and ask the kids, that's a great way to find homes, is you ask the kids, because they know where the dogs belong. And then a child told us where it was. So we knocked on the door and we found the guy who owned it, and he wanted his dog back. And we said, well, will you let us sterilize it and put a microchip in it? And, and he said, yeah, of course, that's fine. So we did that, we brought it back to him, and months later, we got a phone call from the shelter. This is back in the old days. And they said, we're about to euthanize your dog, uh, unless you come pick it up in an hour. This was the dog that we had saved, but we had put ourselves on the microchip as a backup. And this didn't make any sense to us because A, we were on the microchip, so they should have scanned that on intake. And when we got there, the dog still had the collar on with his tags on, with the address of the per persons. And then we looked up the paperwork. He was picked up in front of his apartment. 
So instead of returning the animal to its owner in, that was literally in front of the animal control officer back in the day when they were encouraged and they were measured by how many animals they brought in rather than how many they returned to their home, that dog got brought into the shelter. They didn't scan it on intake. So it sat in the shelter for three days, got kennel cough, and uh, got incredibly sick. And then, we had, and then they called us right before they were going to euthanize it. Whereas now, today, they scan it in the field, they have the microchip reader in the field, they've got, um, that's the difference between the old method of bring them in, round them up as much as you can in the new method. And more than anything else, a compassionate director. You don't, all of this stuff, all of the programs don't matter if you don't have a director who wants to make it happen. At the beginning, get to know your animal welfare landscape. Who are the key stakeholders in your, in your community? Who are the people that speak for animals, rightly or wrongly, in your, in your community? Meet with every one of them. Again, this is one of the things that I did, but found that every single one of them was not interested in changing. And one of them, by the way, was Emancipet, which was our spay-neuter clinic that Dr. Jefferson was in charge of. Like all of the groups in the animal welfare landscape when we started, none of them, not a single one of them was interested in change. All of the stakeholders wanted to keep it just the way that, that it was. But you will probably not have that same response today because things are a lot different now in America in, as far as no-kill goes than they were in 2005. Figure out if they are using the no-kill equation. Go through the, the 12 ingredients of the no-kill equation and see which ones they're doing, because that's going to tell you a whole lot. Do they have a foster program? How big is it? How many adoptions are they doing? What is their intake? Try to figure out, you know, we talked about earlier today, we talked about the measurements, the things you want to measure uh, to determine whether or not your shelter is succeeding. The best you can figure out whether your shelter is succeeding based on those same measurements. What is its budget? What is its intake? How many adoptions or rescue groups working with it? You can kind of diagnose the things that are wrong with your shelter based on whether or not it is implementing the 12 ingredients or the no-kill equation. And most important, of course, is what kind of shelter director do you have? You know, I went into, um, I, I, I on occasion will get requested by another city to consult on animal welfare. And I can tell you within the first three minutes of meeting that director whether or not that city is going to go no-kill. I can tell you within three minutes. Because if the th first three minutes of that person is telling me how horrible the public is and how many animals they have and how it's impossible to do in their community, it's not going to happen. And I have, I will tell you this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of this, but a little ashamed of it. Uh, I met a rec recent shelter director within the last five years. Same thing, they came to me, they wanted to talk, they wanted to make improvements. And uh, I met the shelter director, spent about half an hour with them, and it became very clear this person is not going to, to do it, right? And I told him, um, I have seen your future. And if you don't implement these programs, you're going to be fired. And ultimately he was. But you can tell that quickly whether that person in your community is going to be someone who's going to embrace reform and changes or someone who's going to do the same stuff that they've always done. Identify your goals. This is really important. I know it's some basic advocacy stuff, but uh, we talked or, or just, just a minute ago, we gave an award to Cheryl Schneider. The, the, the horrible stuff that happened at her shelter before she got there, um, I didn't know about it. I got called about 2 o'clock in the morning. Still don't know how this person got my cell phone in the middle of the night. I got told, called at 2 o'clock in the morning by someone who said, I have to tell you what I saw at the shelter today. I was doing voluntary cleaning at the shelter because that's the only thing they would let volunteers do. And I found a feral cat in a box outside in 170 degree heat and it had shriveled up and died because the animal controls officer brought it in, they put it on the back porch and then they left it there for three days. She found the body of a feral cat in a feral cat cage that the shelter had just didn't, didn't care about, didn't do anything with. And the first thing she said is, who do I call, PETA? If you know anything about no-kill, no, PETA is not the person that you call. Um, and so figuring out who do you, who your, what your goals are, what is it that you want to do with this information? She didn't know. She just knew that she needed to tell somebody. But what is it that you want to accomplish? What is it, who is it that you need to speak to to make that happen? Craft your message, implement key strategies, and we'll, talk, we'll go through them. So my group, Fix Austin, which really is no longer... Um, an organization because we don't our, our job is done as far as advocacy goes in Austin for the most part but back in roughly 2008 2007 the 
about 10 of us in Austin, we went to one of, one of the person's offices and we did like whiteboard work, you know, where you go and you brainstorm and you try to figure out what it is that you want to accomplish by the end of the by the end of your lifetime in this movement. And this is what we wrote down, become a no-kill community, which at the time we had defined as a 90% save rate. We now know that it's much higher than that, right? It's probably more like 95, 96, 97, 98%. By the time we thought it was roughly 90%. Rigorous implementation of the no-kill equation or Dr. Jefferson's 12 ingredients. A progressive shelter leadership, and that does mean re regime change and leadership change if necessary. And lastly, we wanted to codify those changes. And it's so kind of, it's really cool because we have accomplished all of those things and we are now working on codifying all of those changes which we, have, which we have started the process of doing. So who is your audience? Your primary, your audience is the people who can actually do the things that you want done and the people who can affect the people who do the things that you actually want done. So PETA doesn't help, right? They're not going to do anything in your local community and they're not gonna make anybody in your local community do anything. So while it would have been easy for her to call PETA, I'm sure they would have rushed there for a press opportunity. They're, they're not the people that can actually, are actually gonna do anything to, in, to in your community to, to affect change. So I like to say that the shelter director, the, your shelter director is the primary person that can affect change in your community, and then also the governing body of your shelter. And that could be a county commission or a county uh, supervisor. It could be a city council and a mayor, or it could be if, you're, if, the non, if the shelter is run by a nonprofit, it could be the nonprofit's board of directors, which often, if it has the contract with a city or municipality, has another level of government control above the nonprofit's board of directors. But those are the people who can directly affect change in your shelter. And then, of course, there's the secondary, the people who can affect the people who can, who can direct the change, and that is the public, by and large, who I will say is with you way more than you, than you know. Um, animal welfare, I think, is, the, is, is this rare, bizarre industry where the, the people in the industry are less progressive, by and large, than the public is about that industry. And so we have this weird thing where, uh, even back in the day, like back in 2009 you know, or eight, when all the shelter directors across the country were, were against no-kill and believed that they had to kill their way out of it. If you walk to a member of the public, a random member of the public, and you say, do you, do you think the shelter should be killing animals? They would say, no, no way. I don't think the shelter should be killing animals. So how is it that we got to that place where the shelter industry is less progressive than the public? You know, it's really fascinating. And I don't know that there's another sh social movement where the leaders are less progressive than the public. Although there are plenty of social movements that were fractured, right? Every so and pretty much every social movement you look at, historically, there were people in different branches of that movement that had different ideas for how, how far or how hard they should push. And so, and then the press. The press can impact the people who can impact the changes. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, crafting your message. Very, very important to keep your message as simple as possible. Uh, there's, a, there's a political advisor who says, um, just about the time, you're gonna figure out what your message is, you're gonna repeat it, and just about the time that you are sick to death of saying it is the, is the time that it might begin sinking into your audience. So figure out what that message is and keep it as simple as possible and on, honestly, as non-judgmental as possible. Say facts rather than, than, than making allegations. So we use this in, in multiple of our advertisements. We use this sentence, under the shel current shelter management, the city has killed more than 100,000 lost and homeless pets. Fact, right? Can't be disputed. As a matter of fact, true. But how does that language make someone feel? Right? It's not judgmental language, but it makes you feel angry looking at it. And that, so that's the kind of thing you want to do. And, and I do this in law, too. You have to explain the facts to the judge in a way that are non-judgmental, but you want the judge to, to be persuaded to side with you because of those facts. And it's very important. What's that? Where do you get those stats? Where do you get stats? Um, well, for, for us, we had a, even in the old days, on, fortunately for us was pretty transparent and they did monthly reports. But to get your data is, is you're gonna, mostly you're likely you're gonna have to file a Freedom of Information Act or a Open Records Act um, request. And so long as you do though in writing, in some, in some places they accept email as writing as they do here in Austin. Um, 
but in, mo in most places, most states will have an Open Records Act, and so they have to give you the records. Now, they don't have to tally these numbers for you. They just have to give you the records. But you can ask for monthly reports, annual reports. You can ask for any reports that they've provided to the city council or county commission. Um, and if they are the public shelter, then they have to give it to you. There's some different rules for private. But, but that's what it, one of the things that I said, and it really had an impact. And we said it over and over and over and over again. Use high impact language like I used earlier. And I noticed the, right, I could see your faces when I said the city killed one animal every 12 minutes the shelter was open. Right? It is a pretty, pretty breathtaking sentence, but it's very, very simple. It conveys a fact, and I haven't yelled at anybody. Like, I haven't blamed anybody for this. I've just said a fact, which is for the last you know, decade, the city has killed an animal once every 12 minutes, I mean, which is astonishing. Target your message to your goal. So one of the things that we started early on was that the city was planning to uh, close the downtown shelter, which is now Austin Pets Alive, and move our, rebuild a new shelter in um, what is pretty far east Austin, which is an, uh, the least populated area of Austin. And ultimately they did, as you now know, but, and, but we got a compromise. We, we were saying that the city should rebuild it where it is to keep it down down, keep it where the people are, keep it where the runners are, keep it where the employees are. And all of the other organiza or, uh, organizations, including the National ASPCA, who had a person in Austin living here to lobby on behalf of the ASPCA, all of them argued, no, the shelter should be out in the middle of nowhere, and it doesn't matter where you build it, people will come. Of course, that was false. Um, there's a reason that every retail establishment tries to get where you are rather than tries to convince you to go eight miles away from where you are, and it's because being in front of you matters. And so um, one of the things we said is if the city moved the shelter, if the city moves the shelter, even more dogs and cats will die. Very simple sentence. We said it over and over and over again. And eventually, the press started repeating that as our position because we said the same thing over and over again. Here's a little trick, trick is that if you are doing a television uh, interview, um, they're trying to get about seven seconds from you. That's all they're trying to get when they come to your when, when they come to meet with you. You want that seven seconds to be exactly what you want it to be. I completely ignore the questions when the press comes and asks me a question because I don't care what they think the story is. I care what I think the story is. So I'm gonna tell them my seven seconds over and over again. And if, that, if they had asked me what I had for lunch, I would have said, if the city moves the animal shelter, even more dogs and cats will die. That's how important your message is, is that you wanna you want to bring, I don't even care what the question is, you want to bring it to what you want that story to be about, not what somebody else wants the story to be about. And you repeat, repeat, and repeat until you're sick to death. So keep your message simple and consistent and focus on the unnecessary, unnecessary killing and the missing programs rather than the personalities. So uh, another thing is like, you know, if you have a shelter director that's been there for a long, long time, they're in it. And they know the city manager, and they know the city council, and their kids go to the same schools, and they've been at the same t-ball games. Like, don't play the game of, I'm going to pick this one person, I'm going to try to get them out. Instead, focus on the facts. Focus on the programs that are missing and what needs to be implemented, because eventually those, those people who can't do it will prove to that. They will prove to even the city managers that they can't do it. And I always say, if someone tells you they can't do something, then believe them. And because there are a lot of shelter managers out there who are failing, and if you say, we need to do this, they'll say, I can't do that. Like, All right, I believe you that you can't do that. Now, can you please step aside to let somebody who can? Every now, they will out themselves if you can keep your, your message consistent and simple and professional. Another thing we decided very early on was we were going to behave professionally like professional lobbyists at all times. So it's one of the reasons that I wear suits to these conferences is because I want to project that professionalism that I would want every one of you to project when you get in before a city council. So instead, you want to look like the people who go in there and get stuff done. You want to behave like them. You want to act like them. If you go to a city council meeting in like t-shirts and ripped jeans and you put up, hold up signs that say end the killing and then you leave and they don't help you, they, they're not gonna vote for you that first time, so many people conclude that the system is broken and it's just, it can't be fixed. Well, those lobbyists don't do that. That's not what they do. They go build relationships. 
They go meet with people, they meet with staff, they leave them with professional materials, and they go back time and time and time and time again. They, they are relentless. And that's what it takes to affect change from a public policy uh, governance. That's what it, it takes, is you have to be like the people who actually get stuff done at City Hall. So we dress professionally at all times when communicating with the, with the public officials, the directors, even the press. Press wanted to do a story, I got in, it ready, I got in a suit. It's easier for me now because I suit up every day at work, but um, I didn't at the time, but I would go home and change and meet them in a suit. Um, keep the website, uh, keep your press releases, your emails, all of your, all of your other communications as professional looking as possible because you want to trick them into believing that you are a professional organization. Because there are a lot of things that people look to to decide very quickly, are you legit? They want to know if you have, you have a website. They want to know, what's that? 10 minutes, ha, I'm gonna run over. Um, they want to know if you have, uh, how, uh, they judge you very quickly on whether or not you're legitimate. And so everything that you want to do, you want to make very professional looking. Use advocacy tools like a website. Everybody, it's, even today, even though websites aren't like the biggest thing anymore, that's the first thing that people are gonna look for. Well, does this organization have a website? Because if it doesn't have a website, they're not very organized. Uh, we put together an email subscription list so that any person who contacted us through our website, we dumped back into our email system and then started communicating with them. Every person you come in contact with should now be getting your emails from your organization. Everybody you meet here, everybody you meet in your city, every county official you meet, everybody should be going into your email system. And then of course, using social media, which is a lot harder now than it used to be. Because it used to be that if you had 10,000 followers and you put up a Facebook post, they would, they would show it to 3,000 of them. Now they're showing it to like 100 of them. So it's a lot harder to use social media now, but the people who are good at it are still getting it, it done. Um, this was an organization that, uh, that put together a website after one of my uh, conferences. I just thought it was pretty cool. It's not that hard to do. You can put these things together and websites are way easier to do now, much more professionally and easily. Okay, advocacy tools. Uh, in addition to an email subscription list, you, you should make a media list. A media list is every person in your media who you think may impact the situation. And it doesn't have to be a news reporter or an investigative reporter. If some reporter signs off and says, don't forget to spay new to your pets, you know you got one, right? That's somebody who might be interested. If there's a reporter who occasionally go goes and does adoption um, stories, that's a reporter that you wanna be on your list. And every single news station, both television and um, um, and print media, they all have an info at box, which is a submission box where you can submit pr press releases to their organization. That's how they get a lot of their stories. On a slow news day, they will go through those submissions and they will pick one. And if you can give them a great animal welfare story, they're gonna, come, they're gonna come get it. And then you will become a resource for them for stories in the future. So we did this all the time at the beginning and it got to the point where they would literally call me on my cell phone, hey, we need a story, we, we're, we're missing, you know, we need another story today, can you give us something? And I would give them a story to work on. Develop relationships. Relationships are probably the most important thing you can do for advocacy. Because you gotta get to the point where people want to help you, not that people fear what you're gonna do to them if they don't. Real relationships is the way it's done. That's why it's so hard to break in at the beginning because everybody else has relationships with each other. But you've got to break into that and have real relationships. I tell this story about a member of the press. There was one member of the press who was writing negative, negative, negative story after us all, 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 over and over again. And I happened to be sitting next to her at a press conference one time, standing next to her, and we realized that we had a very close mutual friend in DC. We're both here. Uh, one, of our, one of her friends in D.C. was one of my friends in D.C. And at that moment, all the press coverage changed from that, from that person, right? So it's because it's really hard to do negative stories on somebody you know. Real relationships matter. And then you can write, do press releases. Um, again, that, send those to that, those submission and info at uh, email addresses and always make them professional. I'll go through one in a second. And then you can buy media too. So there's earned media and there's purchased media. Earned media is what they are gonna co cover you because they want to do a story on you. And then purchased is what you have to buy to get into the newspaper sometimes. So this was one of our early press releases. FixAustin.org was the name of the, our organization at the time. 
and someone had, had gone around to multiple uh, APA adoption sites and stolen all of, the t all of the donation jars. And so they had lost like three or $400 that day. And I put this up, up, sent this to the news stations, they all covered it, and some woman called and said, whatever it was that you lost, I wanna double it and give it to you, right? Get that story. This is a perfect story for the press to pick up on. Somebody stole the animal welfare group's donation jars, right? Anything can be a story. Anything to get your name out there is a good thing. This was purchased media. This was a, we started purchasing full page advertisements both in our weekly newspaper and in our daily newspaper. And, this, and we did this kind of theme of uh, how, how you could help pets. In 508 BC, the Greeks invented a system that can dramatically reduce the killing of Austin's lost and home pets, democracy. And here's another thing on the bottom. We always have an ask. If you're not asking for something, you're wasting your communication. So you always need to ask for something in every communication from your people. And so here we asked, we, we asked them to email or call the city council, told them what to, to say, and we gave them their phone numbers and their email addresses and their names. So do the work for people so that they don't have to go do that. If we had just said, call your city council and we didn't give them the numbers, nobody would have done it, right? We had to make it easy for them. Another one, in the 1980s, Al Gore invented a device that can, can dramatically reduce the killing of Austin's lost and homeless pets, the internet. Same thing, have an ask on the bottom. This is called spot color. So there are three different types of ads you can buy. Black and white, spot color, and color. Spot color is where you add one color to the ad. And so there are three different price range, ranges. Get involved with politics. The same thing about getting relationships with the media, you gotta get relationships with the policymakers. real relationships. What I tell people is if your city council member it does not stop to say hello to you if you see them at the grocery store, then you not, have not yet established that relationship. They don't have to like you, they don't have to love you, but if they respect you enough to stop and say hello, then you've gotten to the point where you actually have a real relationship with them. Lobby and educate decision makers, be prepared. We always left materials, bound materials, with every city council member that we met with. And one of them, it was awesome, because another one of the animal welfare groups came to them and they said, don't listen to that group, we're saving way more lives. And the council member knew, because we had just you know, get informed him, he's like, that's not true. And the person was like, yeah, it is. And he pulled out the pamphlet that we had just given him, and he turned to the page that had the number of animals pulled by each rescue group, and he turned around and he handed it to the lobbyist for the other organization, who had to you know, stop talking at that point, because he was wrong. Be prepared and prepare your council members. We also got involved in campaigns. So what we did is a five-paw a, a five system for um, council members who were um, committing to save animals' lives. Five paws for the ones that did the best, and then all the way down to you know, two or one paw. And this is a political game, right? If you know somebody's going to win, you don't trash them because they're going to win. Um, you, have to, you have to be very smart and very rational and sometimes cynical, but you got to do your best to get in the door. And the number one place that we were able to affect, the number one occasion that we were able to affect council members is when they were running for office, especially the first time. Because when they run the first time, they're trying to develop um, these, these groups of constituents to vote for them. And they're committing to things. And we also made them uh, uh, answer questionnaires in writing that we then published on our website so that they were essentially committing to things. And we made the questions hard. Will you commit to do X? Again, talking about the ask, I made the mistake early on of meeting with council members and not asking for anything at the beginning, at the end of the conversation. Boy, was that a mistake, right? I just used my 20 minutes that I get with them and I didn't ask for anything. So you have to do an ask. And ask is one of the most important things you can do. The status quo is powerful and against you. Um, it looks to protect itself, it looks to consolidate power, it will deny that problems exist, it will attack you as being the uninformed, naive activist, it will redirect criticism and blame the public and, and say things like, well, things could be worse than what we are, things are worse than death. They will claim credit once things are, good things are happening, even if you're the ones that are doing them. They will falsely claim reform and change when none of it's happening. And they expect you to give up and go away because that's what everybody else does on every issue. The number of people that go to city council in t-shirts, holding up signs one time and then never come back, you could fill a, you know, a stadium with them. Because people just conclude that they tried, it failed, and the system is broken. And that's not how it works. It's the opposite. The system works, but only for those people who work hard and stick with it. 
the public officials, at least for us, were very much against us at the beginning. Shelter management, PETA, absolutely 100% against us. And for us, the major current animal welfare groups and the, the press, who was listening to the people that they had always listened to, say how dumb we were and how we were activists and how we didn't know what we were talking about. But American Pets Alive is now with you, the Noakle Advocacy Center, um, Nathan Winograd, Maddie's Fund, best friends, the public when you talk to them, because they, they will know once you tell them. And the sympathetic and informed press, once you explain to them and once you develop those relationships, they will be your advocates too. And animal lovers all over the country. Like I said, this country is far more ready for no kill than the people in the animal welfare industry. So it'll be a battle, it'll take time. The status quo is against you but the system is built to give you the tools that you need to make changes. So how to respond to the status quo? Well, I say always, always, always take the high road. Expect to be attacked. I've been told, again, one of the lessons that people told me that, they were, that was so valuable to them is thank you for telling me I was gonna get punched in the stomach, not literally, but metaphorically, right? Thank you for telling me how hard, how hard this was gonna be and how people were gonna insult me. Um, both of the newspapers have insulted me by name in our newspapers because of the work that we've done. Um, one of them put me on the cover of the local uh, weekly magazine. That was supposed to be me. Um, and it said, animal advocates are at each other's throats. And um, this organization, that, or that weekly magazine, now like sponsors our events, right? But back in the day, it was easy to make us, you know, be the enemy, be the monster. I called, I used to work for a firm that was based in Dallas, and I called one of the partners there that day. I was an associate, and I said, I'm, I feel like I have to tell you that the local news, newspaper um, drew me with a wolf's head and put me on the cover of the newspaper. And he's like, that's crazy. And, and I emailed him, and he called me back, and he's like, yeah, that's you. <laughs> Um, the whole story was about how, it wasn't about me, it was about Ellen, and it was, the whole story was about how horrible of a human being Dr. Jefferson is, the whole story. All right, so they're going to say it's really just overpopulation, and you're going to know because you've been here that there are, in fact, far more homes available for pets in America than there are animals entering shelters, something to the tune of seven to ten times. They're going to say it's all the irresponsible public's fault, and you're going to say, well, look, the public may be responsible for what happens and why they come into the animal shelter, but we're responsible for them once they come into the animal shelter. We get to choose what happens to the animal once they come in. Maybe they came in for any number of reasons, but we're responsible for them now. So what happens to them once they come into the door is on us, not on someone else. And blaming the public has never, ever once ended shelter killing. So let's get out of the blame game and get into the solution game. They're going to say you can't adopt your way out of the killing. Uh, they're going to say that spay, neuter, and mandatory laws are the only way, but you're going to know that getting animals out alive is, in fact, the fastest way to stop killing. Not killing is the fastest way to stop killing. And spay, neuter is a part of it, but mandatory spay, neuter laws have never worked in any community to, sit, to become a no-go community. They do not work. In fact, they do the opposite. When some cities have implemented mandatory spay, neuter laws, the intake has increased and the number of, and the killing has increased because what you do is you separate families from their animals. They're gonna say no-kill is too expensive, and you're gonna say no, I've no, I know this, there's in fact no correlation between a shelter's budget and its save rate. There are really wealthy shelters that kill almost all of the animals that come in their door, and there are really poor shelters who save almost all of them. They're gonna say that no-kill can't work in my community, and you're gonna say how dare you. Right? My, this is my community and you're going to blame us. You think Austin is so special. You think Ithaca is so special. You think Reno is so special. Every, every community, every city ha it has the public in it, right? Every single one. And the public did not switch like a switch when Austin became no-co. What happened was the programs and policies changes. That's what made Austin no-co. Not the public changing its mind, but the changes at the shelter. They're going to say, how could you? Shelter employees do everything they can. To, to, they love animals. And you're going to say, I'm not blaming any person. Let's talk about the programs that work. Let's talk about the programs that are not being implemented here. And let's implement those programs. Become a power player. Spend money. Donate to campaigns. Buy full page ads. So one of the, the interesting things was, um, and av you can check with your newspapers to see if they do this. On occasion, an advertiser will pull an ad at the last minute from a newspaper, and they have, they have to have a plan for that. 
And what they do is they heavily discount that ad at the last minute. And if you tell them, one of the things we did is we went to the, the daily newspaper and we said, if that ever happens, here's an ad, we just want you to run it, and we'll, we'll agree to this price in advance. And wouldn't you know, some big you know, advertiser like Dillard's or Macy's pulled out at the last second, and we had an ad for one-fifth of the cost of the ad lined up for them. They ran it. The, show, the city manager called the statesman and asked how much we paid for that ad. And a local news station did a story on how these advocates must be serious because they ran a full page ad in the newspaper. And everybody assumed that we paid full price and we didn't. You have to kind of create this image that you are stronger and bigger and smarter than you, than you actually are. It took about 10 people to do this in Austin, in a city of a million people, because we created this myth that we were bigger and stronger and richer than the other side was. Stick around, it's those who do not quit that win. If you are a force of nature, the other side, I promise you, will quit. They always do. Build relationships with the press and public officials. Communicate and, and repeat clear, rational, and logical message, messaging. How will you know you're winning? One of the moments that we knew we were winning in Austin was that the um, all the other animal welfare groups, eventually Dr. Jefferson kind of switched sides, formed APA, and we became with them the voice of the no-kill movement in Austin. And the other side with the uh, city management decided that there's no way the public is with us. It must be with them. And they, uh, so they decided to have a big public forum and they were gonna prove to us how much the public was on their side against no-kill and not on our side in favor of no-kill. And of course, you know, you tell me we're going to have a public forum on no-kill, I'm like, bring it on. Like, you just, like, please throw me that into that briar patch, right? Please, please throw me into the briar patch. Because we knew the public was with us, and we knew we could win that. So we started marketing the heck out of their public forum. And so the public forum was one night, uh, on, a, on a weeknight at a city-owned facility, and 150 people showed up to the public forum. And they got word that so many people were showing, and they all texted themselves, don't show, don't show, don't show. So the people against no-kill didn't even show up to speak for themselves. They left the poor anti-no-kill city uh, shelter director to speak on their behalf. And the city had hired this moderator to moderate the whole thing. And he kind of took input and took input, and then finally he's like, okay, thanks, everybody can go home now. And there's a guy in the audience, a professor at UT, and he's like, I think we should vote. Yeah, I got it. He said, I think we should vote. And, uh, and, and the guy said, no, 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 we're not going to vote. We're not going to vote. And then, nope. And the guy stood up and he says, you work for us, not the other way around. They voted, and it was 150 to zero in favor of no-kill. And so the change is going to happen. It is going to happen. You just have to outwork them. The shelter director, if, if, it's in, if that person is against no-kill, will eventually move on. The live outcomes were sore. You will never get credit for it, but that won't matter to you. And this is my favorite quote. We must combine the toughness of the serpent and the softness of the dove, a tough mind and a tender heart. Because that's truly what this is about, is a movement of love, a movement of valuing every life. And um, if we're tough and we work hard enough, we can make it happen in your community. So thank you. That's all I got. And I appreciate you guys coming. <laughs>